Hello everyone, and welcome to Scare Interesting. In this video, we're going to look at two incredibly creepy cases of people disappearing, and some found footage related to each of the cases that makes things even more disturbing. As always, viewer discretion is strongly advised. In 2006, life was going really well for Jennifer Kess. Three years earlier, she'd graduated with honors from the University of Central Florida, where she'd been studying for a degree in finance. It wasn't hard for her to find a job after either, and so almost right away, she landed a position as a financial analyst for an investment firm. Her personality was a perfect fit for the job. Jennifer always wanted to learn more, and she had a dynamic energy that could light up any room. At the same time, her parents also instilled a sense of caution in her. They'd been mugged at gunpoint in New Jersey years earlier, and they wanted their daughter to always be safe. By feeding this combination of energy and caution into her work, she got promoted twice in two years, quickly earning enough money to buy a condo at the Mosaic Millennia Condominium Complex in Orlando. And for the most part, this was a great place to live. It was fancy and gated and was right in the heart of the city and only a mile down the road from a brand new mall. When she moved in, a lot of the condos were still undergoing a conversion from apartments, and because of this, she had to put up with a lot of construction work and the construction workers that came with it. The daily comments and catcalls obviously were incredibly annoying, and whenever one of the workers had to go into her apartment to do anything, she was on the phone with her parents until they left, just to be safe. But she thought it was worth it to own such a prime piece of real estate so young, and the workers would be gone before too long anyway. If it ever got too much, she could always rely on her boyfriend Rob to talk to the workers and get them to tone things down. Jennifer and Rob met while Rob was visiting Orlando for a trade show that her firm was exhibiting, and from then on, Rob and Jennifer were said to be very much in love, even though they chose not to move in together. They both had careers they wanted to focus on, and because their jobs were about three hours apart, they had to make do with a long-distance relationship in the meantime. Instead, they made up for lost time every weekend and called each other and texted each other daily. In 2005, they decided to go on a five-day vacation together the following January and flew out to St. Croix in the British Virgin Islands. Their return flight landed late in the evening, so Jennifer decided to spend the night at Rob's and then drive straight to work the following morning. She had a normal day at work, despite being tired, and then at about 6pm, she left her office and went home and called her dad and brother to tell them how amazing her trip had been. Then after getting home, she called her mother and her closest friend and she told them every detail on how the trip was like something out of a fairy tale. Meanwhile, Rob felt exactly the same way. On the day they returned, his best friend even joked with him that he was in love with Jennifer, even if he wouldn't admit it. Sadly for Rob, the last time he spoke to Jennifer didn't go so well. At 10pm, she called and they got into an argument. Rob said that the long distance relationship was making things more complicated than they wanted, which was one of the reasons he found it hard to admit to himself how much he cared about her. The following morning, Rob didn't get the call he usually got from Jennifer before she left work. He tried calling her, but it went straight to voicemail, and at first he was worried that she was still upset with him for the disagreement the night before, but he thought she'd just cool down at work and then they could talk. So he went to his morning meeting, and after he came out, he tried to call her again. And again, it went to voicemail. After the next meeting, he tried again, and the same thing happened. This wasn't normal behavior for Jennifer, and their argument hadn't been that bad, so Rob started to get worried. At the same time, Jennifer's boss called one of Jennifer and her parents' mutual friends. Jennifer hadn't turned up to work and hadn't called, which was extremely unusual. She was the type of person who was happy to get up at 6am and drive 3 hours to make it to the office on time. She would even call the office if she was only just five minutes late. So next, figuring she might be at her parents, the family friend then called to find out if she was over there, maybe too sick to tell anyone. Her dad took the call in his office and Jennifer wasn't there, so he called her cell phone. His call then also went to voicemail and it never went to voicemail. The family had one rule, if one of the parents called, you answered. When they were a little younger, not answering the phone meant losing their phone and car privileges, and even though Jennifer was older now, it was a habit that had stuck. Right away, her parents seemed to sense that something terrible had happened, so the whole family jumped in their car and set off to Orlando. As they drove, her dad called the police, and then they called the condo office to see if they could check and see if her car was still there. Someone went down to check, but he couldn't see it, so even more worried, her parents asked him to check out her condo. A few moments later, after the worker had found another person to make sure it was legal to enter, the man from the condo called back. No one was in her apartment and everything looked fine. When the family arrived, they looked inside Jennifer's place and it was just as the guy from the office described it. The t-shirt she wore to bed was on the floor, her makeup was all over her countertop, and the shower and a towel were still wet. It seemed apparent that she'd at least gotten ready for work and hadn't been gone for long. While they were there, they were met by a police officer and her parents explained what was happening and tried to make them understand that this wasn't normal behavior. Unfortunately, the officer either didn't get it or didn't care. 
He told them she probably just went somewhere to cool off after arguing with her boyfriend and then left the scene. So with the police doing nothing, Jennifer's parents got as many friends and family together as possible and started looking for her themselves. They put up posters, handed out flyers for their picture, and went everywhere that Jennifer might have gone, which included the mall, her favorite bars, and her usual route to work. That night, when she still hadn't shown up, the police finally declared her missing. Two days later, a tenant living close by recognized her car from a news report and let the police know that one just like it had been sitting abandoned outside her apartment for days. Later, another person claimed to have spotted Jennifer's car swerving near her condo, with two people struggling to control the steering wheel inside. However, this crucial piece of information didn't come forward until much later. When they initially found the car, it was parked a mile from her place in another condo complex called Huntington in the Green. This wasn't the nice block Jennifer lived in, but instead a rougher area known for its high crime rate. They would go on to find one of Jennifer's fingerprints and a large boot print on the gas pedal. They also found a DNA fragment in the car that didn't belong to anyone Jennifer knew, but unfortunately it didn't match anyone already on the police database either. Maybe the worst though was that all her valuables were still in the car, suggesting it hadn't been a regular robbery. It also looked as someone had wiped the car down to remove any evidence they might have left. Weirdly, police also said there didn't seem to be any sign of a struggle. After her car was thoroughly searched and no leads were found, police realized that there were plenty of surveillance cameras pointed in the direction near where the car was parked. The police then checked the cameras and found a single piece of footage of some time after she disappeared. In the video, a man dressed in workman's clothes parked Jennifer's car, sat motionless for 30 seconds, and then exited the vehicle and walked away. Unfortunately, there was no video of Jennifer in and around the car, just that single clip of the car and then the car was abandoned afterward. And unfortunately, no matter what camera angle they looked at, a fence blocked the man's face, making it impossible to identify who it was. They tried everything they could to enhance the image, calling in favors from the FBI and NASA, who also did the best they could, but in the end, all they could really determine that it was a man between 5'3 and 5'5 with large feet for his height. This wasn't really helpful either because so many workers who fit that description lived in that building and the condos close to it. Quite a few of them were also people who worked on the conversions at Jennifer's own condo and had been given somewhere to stay while the work continued. So next, the police used a scent dog to see if they could find any trace of this person. The dog would go on to lead them from her car back to her condo complex, so they wondered if whoever it was in the video had returned to her condo parking lot after abandoning the car. It's possible he wasn't from there at all and had only left the car to throw the police off his scent. While the investigation continued, Jennifer's parents moved into her apartment. They wanted to be as close to the investigation as possible, and living at the possible crime scene was as close as it got. But unfortunately, despite the video footage, police began by interviewing anyone close to Jennifer rather than following what seemed to be such an obvious lead, which was the man in the video. First, they interviewed her ex-boyfriend Matt. Jennifer didn't know this, but while she'd been in the Virgin Islands with Rob, her brother had invited Matt and another friend to stay with him at the condo. This actually wasn't all that unusual since her brother and Matt were still good friends, but the police were told that Matt had been upset since they split up and was jealous of her relationship with Rob and wanted to get back together with her. Despite this, after the interviews, there was nothing to suggest that Matt had anything to do with her disappearance. They also quickly ruled out her family and then Rob too. Then they questioned her co-workers, but again, this was just another dead end. In May of 2007, so several months after she disappeared, Jennifer's company put up a $1 million reward for any information that could help find her by July 4th. To claim the money though, she had to be alive. The hope was that if she'd been abducted for human trafficking, the people involved might prefer a quick million dollars over the hassle of keeping her hidden. Unfortunately, July 4th came and went and the money was never claimed. By then, Jennifer's family had had just about enough of the police, who they thought messed up the investigation from the start. They would go on to spend close to $100,000 on their own investigations and came up with some new and startling information. Not only were they the ones to find the witness who claimed to have seen the car swerving, but they also found evidence that seemed to suggest someone was thrown into the trunk of the car. Apparently, there were scratch marks in and around the trunk of the car that led them to make this conclusion. If they had known this from the beginning, there might have been more urgency during the initial stages of her disappearance. So, finally in frustration, Jennifer's parents went on to lobby with another missing woman's family for a bill to force law enforcement to reform how they react to missing persons. This was passed unanimously in 2008, but unfortunately, in the meantime, the case was passed from Orlando Police to the FBI in 2010, and then to Florida's Cold Case Unit in 2022. Today, Jennifer is still considered to be missing and in danger. For the Jameson family, life in Eufaula, Oklahoma was anything but quiet. Bobby and recently divorced Sherry Lynn met in 2002 and their summer romance blossomed into marriage just two years later. The year before they were married, Bobby was in a bad car accident that caused chronic back pain that would continue to plague him for the rest of his life. 
From that point onward, he found it hard to work, and by the time he was 44, the agony and lack of a job were getting so bad that it was triggering bouts of depression. Despite their recent love and marriage, Sherry Lynn couldn't really care for him either because frankly, she had her own demons. When she was younger, her sister died after being stung by a bee, and from that point on, she struggled with her own deep depression. She had also been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was known to avoid taking the medications she was prescribed for both. By 2009, so five years into their marriage, she was finding it difficult to look after their six-year-old daughter Madison, her son from her first marriage Colton, and Macy, the family dog. And thus far, their marriage was not a happy one. Bobby and Sherry Lynn both found life hard and sometimes that caused heated arguments, and any events outside their disabilities only made things worse. Things really started to escalate when Bobby and Sherry Lynn became convinced that their house was haunted. Their pastor even claimed that Bobby had been trying to exercise the spirits and bought a copy of the Satanic Bible. After his pastor talked to him about it, Bobby claimed he was joking, but his pastor got the impression that Bobby wasn't joking at all. He tried to play it off, but it was fairly obvious he wasn't when he asked if there was some sort of bullet that he could use to shoot demons. Apparently, Bobby was convinced that two, or sometimes four, evil spirits were living on his roof, and Sherry Lynn believed it too. She said that both her and Madison had even seen the spirits inside the house. You see, at the time, Madison had an imaginary friend named Emily. It's obviously not unusual for six-year-olds to have imaginary friends, and especially not in a family that keeps to themselves and whose kids don't have any close friends because of that. But Sherry Lynn was convinced that Emily was an evil spirit. According to their friends and family, Sherry Lynn thought Emily was a witch, and she'd hold seances to try to get the demons away from her daughter. The neighbors, for the most part, didn't take it as seriously as Sherry Lynn, but they did seem to agree that the house was haunted. Sherry Lynn's best friend Nikki claims that she felt a horrible presence and would leave feeling often depressed whenever she went to the house. Whatever the case, weirdly, the Jamesons also owned a storage container like the type you'd find being loaded onto trucks from ships. One morning, the neighbors noticed that Sherry Lynn had graffitied all across the side of it. According to Sherry Lynn, a neighbor had poisoned her black cats, so to warn whoever she thought was doing it, she wrote, three cats killed to date by people in this area. Witches don't like their black cat killed. And this was written in letters big enough for everyone to see. Unfortunately, supposed malevolent spirits weren't the only issues the family had. In July of 2009, Sherry Lynn lost a custody battle with her ex-husband over her son, Colton. During the hearing, Colton, who was 12, apparently even said that he wanted to live with his father. He didn't like how weird his mom acted or how she was constantly depressed. Then, in addition to losing custody of Colton, the family was having issues with someone they were letting stay at their house, a man named Kenneth Bellows. He was a handyman and a friend of the family, and he lived with them for a short while so the Jamesons could get a little bit of extra income by renting a room. This was also to help Bobby with things he couldn't do because of his back, like lifting heavy objects. This was going well at first, but unfortunately, according to Nikki, Sherry Lynn told her that one night when Bobby was out, there had been an incident. Apparently, Kenneth sat uncomfortably close to her on the couch, got in her face, and told her he thought she was disgusting. He knew that she was part Native American, and he wanted her to know that he couldn't stand the sight of her. Sherry Lynn then stood up, went to another room, took out the family's 22 caliber pistol, and pointed it at Kenneth's head. She then told him to get out and never come back, but Kenneth called her bluff and said he knew she wasn't going to shoot him. So instead, she shot the floor just in front of his feet. This got Kenneth moving, and he walked out with a gun pointed at his back and never stayed at their house again. But unfortunately, without the extra income from the room, this only exacerbated the money problems they'd been having. They constantly argued as they struggled to pay bills or cover the lawyer fees for Sherry Lynn's custody battle. It didn't help that they were also suing Madison School after pulling her out of class. Making things worse still, if rumors are to be believed, around the same time Bobby had taken his father to court over the ownership of the family gas station in Oklahoma City. Bobby claimed that his father had agreed to give him half a stake in the business in return for some work he did for him. What his father was really doing, he said, was tricking him into working for nothing. According to Bobby, when he asked his father for his fair share, his father threatened to kill him and his family more than once. He would even call his father a dangerous man who believed himself to be above the law. All of this is to say that basically the family just seemed to run into problem after problem, either with the people they knew or from their own issues. And this would all finally blow up in September of 2009. Sherry Lynn, finding it impossible to take the strain of her depression, her son being taken away, the arguments with Bobby, and the overwhelming sense of paranoia she was feeling, had to be rushed to the hospital after doing something drastic. This was a big turning point, and the family decided they needed a change. So they came up with a plan to buy some land, take their storage container, and live inside of it off-grid away from the stresses of the world, whether they were demons or ex-husbands. And this was a plan they kept secret. None of their friends or family, including Colton, had any idea that he'd even been planning to leave. On October 7th, they set off on a 50-mile drive to the city of Red Oak in the San Boa mountain range to visit a realtor to see a 40-acre plot on the Panola Mountain. This is an area in the eastern part of Oklahoma, close to the Arkansas border. 
The family thought that this plot of land might be a perfect place to put their container and start a new life that would solve all of their problems. Unfortunately, this wasn't smooth either, and on the way there, they got lost and had to abandon their plans and ask for directions home. The next day, something really strange happened. Video surveillance captured Bobby and Sherilyn walking backwards and forwards from their truck. In the footage, they made more than a dozen trips, but weirdly, sometimes they packed something into their truck, other times they walked up to it with nothing in their hands. Every now and then, they just stood still, their faces emotionless, as if they were in some sort of trance. On one of the trips, they loaded a brown case into the vehicle, and sometime later, Sherry Lynn dyed Madison's hair blonde. Sometime after that, they attempted to get to Red Oak again. This time, they found their way there with the help of a GPS and met with their realtor. Bobby then asked the realtor if they could see the land alone and asked for the GPS coordinates. This didn't seem too unusual, it just seemed like they wanted to explore the place independently and get their bearings. So they took their GPS unit and walked for about 15 minutes to the spot on the mountain. It was a quiet and secluded patch of forest, rarely touched by hikers or hunters. They spent a little while looking over what could be their new home, imagining what life might be like once they moved there, and then they returned to their truck. A little while after leaving, down a road northwest of Red Oak, they got out of their truck and locked the doors. Then, on October 12th, so four days after they went to visit the land, one of their phones called someone. The call went to voicemail, but the family didn't leave a message. And after that unanswered phone call, there was just no sign of the Jamesons. With that said, because they were very private, the family was actually known to disappear for long periods of time. Sometimes it would be weeks before any family or friends heard from them, so at first, nobody suspected anything. In the mountains, a few people even passed the Jamesons' abandoned truck. No one thought much of it and just thought they were another set of hikers who had driven up the trail a bit so they didn't have to walk as far. On October 17th, so over a week since the family was last seen, two hunters passed by on dirt bikes and thought they heard something coming from the truck. When they turned back to check it out, they found the family's dog Macy whimpering in the back seat, and she was so thin you could see her ribs. It was clear she'd been there for days, so the hunters decided to call the police. At first, local sheriffs thought the truck might have been stolen and had only been there for a short while, but one of the hunters said he'd seen it there for days. Macy, also being so malnourished, confirmed this. Before doing a thorough search, they checked to see if the truck might have broken down, but they would find that the truck had gas and didn't seem to have been in any sort of accident and ran just fine. Next, they thoroughly searched inside and found a bunch of the family stuff, including their coats, Bobby's wallet, Sherilyn's purse, cell phones, the GPS unit, and maps. There were also a couple of strange items in the truck. The first was a nasty 11-page hate letter that Sherilyn had written to Bobby. In it, she called him a loner and a hermit and listed everything she hated about him. She even wrote that she wanted a divorce. Maybe even more unusual than the letter, though, was the $32,000 in cash they'd stuffed under the driver's seat. Neither Bobby nor Sherilyn was working, so it was weird for them to be carrying so much money. It's also worth noting that there was no sign of the brown case that they had put in their truck in the video footage. There also didn't seem to be any sign of a struggle around the truck, but weirdly, it had stopped in the middle of the road rather than being pulled over and parked, which made it look like someone or something might have forced them to stop in that spot. But otherwise, there wasn't anything you'd expect if the family had been violently abducted, like traces of blood, broken glass, or any other signs of a struggle. There was also a lot of garbage scattered on the truck, as if they'd decide to throw everything out of it when they stopped. The whole scene was just very strange. The police decided to use their GPS and cell phones to see if they could trace the family's last movements. Eventually, they got to where the Jamesons had stopped the truck and realized that the last picture on one of the phones was Madison standing in front of a rock right where they were. There's been a lot of speculation about this picture. Madison is standing wearing a short pink top, her usually brown hair is dyed blonde, and her arms are folded. It's also a bit hard to read her facial expression. Some people think she looks uncomfortable, maybe even upset, while others think she's about to start laughing as her eyes and mouth are narrowed in a sort of smile. Other than this picture, the police were at a bit of a dead end in terms of leads, so they decided to begin a massive search of the area the following day. They used dogs, helicopters, and over 100 police and volunteers, but the search wasn't easy. The weather was terrible, the train was rugged, and hunting season had begun, so they had to be extra careful. Before long, the search was called off and no trace of the family was found. That was until four years later. For a long time, the most popular theory about their disappearance was that they'd run away for some reason. That might explain why Sherilyn had dyed Madison's hair and that there was no trace of them. It didn't explain why the money was left behind or why it looked like someone had stopped the truck, but it gave hope to their friends and family that the three were still alive somewhere. Then, on November 16th, 2013, deer hunters came across some skeletal remains in a remote area of Panola Mountain just over two miles from where the Jamesons were last seen. These remains were the badly decomposing bodies of two adults and one child and were found arranged next to each other in a line. All that was left were three skulls, some of their bones, shoes, and some scraps of clothing. These were the remains of the Jamesons. 
Because of the advanced decomposition, it was impossible to work out what caused their death, but there was a small hole in Bobby's skull. The hunters who found them were sure that this was a bullet hole, and at first the police agreed, but after closer investigation, they realized there was just no way to know what caused the injury. The local sheriff's department and the FBI then spent months on a thorough investigation about how they might have died and possible leads or suspects, but for a while, there was still nothing. They investigated Bobby's father, who had died just two months after his son's family disappeared, and it was determined that it couldn't have been him. He was already unwell and living in a nursing home when they vanished. The FBI also traced Kenneth, the man who was living with them, and quickly ruled him out. It was briefly entertained that maybe he had hired someone in retaliation for being threatened, but the police and FBI thought this was a bit of a stretch. This left them with two more theories that they wanted to follow up on. First, they had to explain the $32,000 and the weird behavior on the day the Jamisons left for Red Oak. Some people have speculated that the trance-like state, the missing brown case, and the cash point to a drug deal gone wrong. It's an area well known for mobile meth labs, which are sometimes hidden along these small trails and in the forest. Given the Jamisons' odd behavior in the lead-up to their disappearance, the $30,000, and the region's known link to drugs, it's not a huge stretch to think that they might have been on something. The problem with this theory is that the police found no sign of drug use at their home. On top of that, Bobby seemed to be strongly against abusing drugs. He'd even once reported a meth lab to the police anonymously, according to the people who knew him. It seems unlikely that he would get involved in something he found distasteful, or that might also implicate him if he was using. The second theory explored by authorities is the darkest. They figured maybe a disturbed Sherry Lynn or an angry Bobby had taken their 22 caliber pistol, marched the family up the mountain, and then shot all of them before turning the barrel on themselves. This seems to explain the weird behavior, the hate letter, and the small hole in Bobby's skull. But there are a lot of problems with this theory as well. First, there was no gun found at the site, and they found no evidence around the bodies that anyone even fired a gun. It would have also been difficult for whoever fired last to have lined themselves up so perfectly with the other victims, let alone the fact that there's no way they could have gotten rid of the gun after the fact. So, for the police, the case was a dead end and has remained a cold case ever since. There are still some other theories, however. People have speculated that the family didn't take that last photograph at all, but instead it was someone who either followed them or they encountered in the woods. People point to Madison's folded arms and hard-to-read expression as proof she was scared when that last picture was taken. So maybe something more sinister happened to the family. And finally, it's also possible that they just decided to go for a walk through the woods near what would soon be their new home, got lost, and died from exposure. Maybe it was colder than they realized, and they went too far and got lost, and then eventually lay down where they were found. In any case, it seems that the family's end was as chaotic as the rest of their story. This is one of those cases that just seems to have more questions than answered, so I'm curious to hear what all of you think. Let me know down in the comments if you have any ideas. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this set of stories. Just a reminder, we now have a scary interesting podcast where you'll find more stories just like this released every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. The link for the podcast is in the description. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to send it to me using the email in the description. And once again, thank you so much for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.